All right, Break Hard Podcast, back again for another week. I, this is basically like Bill Burr's Monday morning podcast. It's just me sitting around talking about racing for 30 to 40 minutes, basically, around that time. So we had the NASCAR Cup Series and Truck Series at Richmond this past week, and the Xfinity Series was at Road America, and we had a Formula One snoozer out in Belgium, which we'll get to in a little bit. We also learned that uh, Shane Van Gisbergen is coming to NASCAR. He said it in his press conference this weekend at the Australian Supercars race. He also said a couple other interesting things that we'll get to in uh, a minute when we get to, well, a few minutes when we get to him. But let's start with the Cup Series race on Sunday at Richmond. It was very typical of a Richmond race that we've seen recently for the Cup Series. Um, and by that, I mean... Not a lot of cautions, not a ton of action, great strategy if you're into strategy, which personally I like a good strategy race, but I know there's a large section of fans out there that definitely don't love that, which is fine, I mean, to each their own, right? But when you have multiple strategies, especially with tire wear and everything like that at Richmond, it can be pretty interesting. The truck series had the same thing happen uh, with it on Saturday night, and I, that was an entertaining race as well. Should they have given up a second Martinsville race for that Richmond race for the truck series? Definitely not, but whatever. We'll get to that in a little bit. But the Cup Series, though, we had a first-time winner this season. Chris Buescher picks up his third career Cup Series win. He now has back-to-back -back seasons with at least one win, which is awesome for him, awesome for that RFK team. Roush Fenway Keselowski brought a ton of speed on Sunday. Brad was a contender. He looked like he had a shot at winning this. Obviously, Chris Buescher won. 2311 Racing brought a ton of speed as well. Tyler Reddick was in contention. Bubba Wallace led a career-high number of laps as well. He led, actually, let me get this straight here. Uh, he led 80 laps, career-high. Brad Keselowski led 102. Chris Buescher led 88. Um, and Tyler Reddick led 81. So you had four guys lead over 80 laps. That, to me, is conducive of a good race. Unfortunately for Richmond it doesn't really race that well anymore. Sure, you had passing. People could pass. Eric on roll in the first stage drove from 24th to 8th. Obviously, Chris Buescher started 26th. He ends up winning the race. So passing was able to happen. There's just something about Richmond that just looks slow. It's not a short track, but it's also not an intermediate. It's a in-between, if we're being honest, because they're definitely getting into the corners quickly, but then they get to the center of the corner. They look like they're going slow. I don't. I hate... I hate a D-shaped short track. Absolutely despise it. I think it looks terrible. I think it's it's not conducive for good racing, especially coming off the corner um, and even getting into the corner as well. It just messes everything up. It messes the whole flow of the race up. But I um, Richmond just hasn't been good lately. And again, there was passing. There's multiple lanes too. You could run middle. You could run bottom. You could all run all the way up next to the wall too if you wanted to. So. That's not the thing either. It's just not a racetrack that has been putting on good racing. You don't have a ton of great racing at the front of the field. Uh, passing, while you could pass, it was a lot easier if you were on a different strategy than somebody else. There were... How many green flag passes in this race? Not that... Give me one second here. NASCAR has not released the loop data yet. Hmm. Alright, so that's something that we'll have to take a look at. But, it was... It was acceptable. I gave it on TikTok. I did a was this a good race um, video. I gave it a 75. It was perfectly acceptable. Wasn't great. Nothing that you're going to write home about, but it was passing. It's a 75. It's a solid C. Nothing f flashy about it. Just somebody that's just here to get the job done, move on to the next one. And that's exactly what this race was. And it, there's nothing wrong with that, right? Like not every race can be an absolute banger. And coming off of a weekend at Pocono, which was the racing that great? It was all right. It was not bad by Pocono standards by any means. But the drama coming out of it certainly had everybody hyped up for Richmond. I saw somebody on Reddit was like, this Richmond race is going to be electric. There's tons of people that are mad at each other. I think we're in to see one of those classic Richmond races. Only a fool would think that after having watched Richmond for the last few years. And if we're being honest, Richmond hasn't put on a good race in over a decade now. I think 2012 was maybe the last time there was a good Richmond race. 2014, if I'm remembering correctly, I think there was a four-way battle for the lead uh, between Gordon, Logano, Keselowski, and maybe Matt Kenseth, if I'm re remembering correctly. 
that was really the last time that there was a good race and that was really only like at the very end of it as well outside of that you got to go back to the mid 2000s maybe uh so yeah richmond has not been good for a while what was once dubbed the action track certainly should not be using that moniker anymore because there is very little to no action happening there's cars going around a track for sure but in terms of the beating and banging and side-by-side -side action and guys getting mad at each other that's not happening at richmond anymore which is fine but it is what it is so chris busher picks up the win he locks himself into the playoffs now he's already in on points but he um so he doesn't take a spot away right so chase elliott fans can breathe a little easier speaking of chase elliott looked strong at the beginning he was running basically third or fourth uh, fifth for that first stage and then into the second a little bit and then man when they lost the handling on that car same with all the hundred cars they just were gone they were non-existent chase elliott ends up finishing 12th uh, on a day where uh, a fourth place finish would have helped a hell of a lot more than a 12th place finish considering michael mcdowell had a really bad day in terms of like finishing he finished 22nd so right now chase elliott sits 40 points below the playoff cutoff line michael mcdowell is plus 18 over ty gibbs aj almendinger who skipped qualifying in practice loses five points this weekend he's now 22 points below the cutoff line and daniel suarez is 34 points behind as well after having an absolutely disastrous day uh, for him he brought out the only natural caution of the day late in the race to set up that late race restart and um yeah michael mcdowell he's currently still in and if chase could have finished you know even seven spots higher that gets him down to 33 ish points back which is uh, more manageable so 40 points four races to go you have michigan watkins glenn nope Take it back. Michigan, Indianapolis, Watkins Glen, Daytona. All tracks that Chase Elliott could win on. He's obviously won at Watkins Glen. He, it's a road course at Indianapolis. He could win there. He could win Daytona because he's got super speedway wins before. Michigan this weekend is going to be a big telling point. I think it's a spot where he can make up some ground on Michael McDowell. Obviously, Fords have been super strong uh, at at uh, Michigan, I think they've won the last seven races there, if I read that correctly or I'm remembering correctly. So McDowell has a shot at being competitive at Michigan. Chase needs to weather the storm there because I think that he's going to be better than McDowell at Indianapolis and Watkins Glen, and then Daytona's a toss-up, right? So, yeah, if you're a Chase Elliott fan, you got to hope that Hendrick brings their A game this weekend at Michigan and doesn't just kind of throw in the towel and coast a little bit mail time it like they have at new hampshire and now seemingly like they did at richmond considering they won richmond earlier in the spring to be as bad as they were on sunday was a bit surprising so you have chris busher winning like i said denny hamlin comes home second kyle bush gets a p3 finish uh, for richard childress racing that's big especially as we consider kyle bush still to be I guess we're considering him a dark horse still to make the championship race, but if he does, Richmond and Phoenix shared some per similarities. Joey Logano finishes fourth. Ryan Priest gets his first top five of the season, first top ten as well. Brad Kozlowski, sixth. Martin Trucks Jr., seventh. Eric Almarola, P8. He drove all the way up to eighth place in the first stage, and then under green flag pit stops, he hit the commitment box. Uh, trying to come to pit road, how to serve a penalty for that, and then how to recover for a P8 finish. Austin Dillon finishes P9, and Kevin Harvick rounds out your top 10. Chase Burst going 11th. Bubba Wallace in 12th. Oh, Chase Elliott finished 13th. My apologies. Ryan Blaney, 14th. Ty Gibbs, 15th. Tyler Reddick, same thing. He hit the commitment box, uh, had to serve a penalty, finishes 16th. Brigginson House, 17th. Alex Bowman, 18th. And Kyle Larson, 19th. Last car in the lead lap. I want to talk about Kyle Larson real quick for a moment um at the end of the race coming to the checker flag kyle larson attempted what appeared to be the ross Chastain wall ride through turn four and then out onto the front stretch coming to the checker flag and you're probably like well he wasn't racing for the victory and he wasn't racing for a playoff transfer spot he was racing for 19th and yeah you'd be correct it's very confusing so why did he do that? I'm not sure. Probably not a good look for the sport. When Ross Chastain did it last year at Martinsville, Kyle said that it would take guts to do that, but also that it made the sport look bad, which you can argue that it makes it look bad and doesn't make it look bad, that it's something we've never seen before. So how does it make the sport look bad if we've never seen it before? You can argue any side of this situation. 
But to say that, after Kyle Larson have already tried this at Homestead the year before racing Denny Hamlin in the Southern 500, to then say that about Ross Chastain doing it was a bit suspect. But then to go and do it, or at least appear to do it, on Sunday at Richmond for 19th is even more confusing. Uh, so shout out to Captain Birthday 7 on Twitter for posting the video. And when I tell you that the quality of this video is bad, I, I, I want you to, whatever your low expectations are, take them even lower. Because this man... I appreciate him putting out the video, but he shot this through a potato. This was an LG flip phone at best. Abraham Zapruder would look at this film and be like, you can't tell shit from this. And he's absolutely right. This video is is not even 480. It's got to be I don't 240 maybe, if that. I, I think you can pick out the pixels if you really wanted to. So the car against the wall <laughs> coming to the checker flag is Kyle Larson. Trust me. Take a look real quick. Listen, I told you it was going to be bad. I, I, I prefaced the fact that this was not a very good video to watch, but it is Kyle Larson. And it is interesting because he did say that when Ross Chastain did it, it was a bad look for the sport. And now if he's doing it for 19th, that's an even worse look for the sport, right? So after Ross did that, NASCAR outlawed it, obviously for safety issues, because if he hit that crossover gate too hard and he goes through it and he hits the wall, we get a Michael Waltrip or a Mike Harmon situation there at at Bristol, where the car just immediately stops, everything goes everywhere, and we're just happy to see somebody climb out. They don't want to see that happen. Don't blame them. Having said all of that, though, there is definitely some gray area around this outlawed wall ride move, and that's the fact that, like, how do you gauge it, especially if you run the top, like at tracks like Darlington, Homestead, Kansas, and even yesterday at Richmond, guys were running right against the wall almost. And who's to say that you don't just get in the wall and then you can't get off of it? And I think Kyle Larson fans would argue that he just got into the wall because he was running the top. I would tend to disagree with that, but to each their own. So I think there is a bit of a gray area here, and I don't know if NASCAR is going to penalize him for it because that would be a little obscure. And in the words of Denny Hamlin, well, that's a penalty. I don't think it is. Uh, but at the same time, I think NASCAR could take a look at it. Fortunately for Kyle Larson, I didn't see the onboard video from his car. I'm not sure if he had one this week. I think he did. I think everybody does now, right? Um, but the NBC cameras didn't catch it because they panned as it was basically happening to pit road to see Chris Butcher's team celebrating, which they should have done because why would you think the car in 19th is going to put it against the wall and try to rip around the top for zero reason to what passed his teammate for 18th? Doesn't make much sense. But having said all of that, Kyle Larson did try to wall ride, which I didn't think we would see it. Richmond is one of the few tracks I think it might actually work at, and it did appear that he picked up some speed um, based off of that. But I also want to just say this. If you're at the racetrack and you're recording something at the end of the race, uh, whatever phone this gentleman shot with, can we get him a better phone? Don't zoom in super far either. I understand people are like, well, you got to zoom in to see the action. Not unless you have one of those like Samsung Galaxy phones that can zoom in 100 times and you can basically see the flag on the moon. Or an iPhone 14 has a pretty decent zoom on it as well. Still not as good as that Samsung, but um, it's not bad nonetheless. If you're, if you're at the racetrack and you're recording, just record. We don't need you to zoom in because then we end up with something like this where we're trying to like match pixels to car colors. And that's just not working out for, for anybody. Um, but either way, at least we have a video of it. So that's interesting as well. So is it a bad look for the sport? No. Who cares? It's for 19th place. But it is just funny that Kyle Larson said that about Ross Chastain and then appears to do the same thing this week. All right, moving on from, from that. Three cautions on Sunday. One of them natural, two of them obviously stage breaks. Daniel Suarez had an absolutely abysmal day. He brings out the caution. Well, Noah Gragson brought out the caution because he tagged Daniel Suarez. And if you're Noah Gragson, you just need next year to come immediately. Obviously, they're switching over to... Toyota next year. I did find it interesting. Legacy Motor Club was one of the teams doing the test on Monday and Tuesday for the new uh, lift splitter that NASCAR is trialing, um, which is odd because I think that maybe the 47 car would have been a better addition um, there, but to each their own. 
Outside of that, the race on Sunday at Richmond wasn't the best ever. Um, obviously, we had Kyle Larson, speaking of Kyle Larson, still run into the back of the 11 car when he caught him on fresher tires. Didn't even give Denny a chance to move out of the way. Just rolled up into the center of the corner, hit him enough that Denny went, like, jolted, moved him up out of the racetrack. Denny passed him back a few laps later when he was on fresher tires. But I think that was a good message by Kyle Larson that, you know, he's not going to race Denny Hamlin the same way he had been. Certainly not the payback. I, that's not eye for an eye. So I think that we could definitely still see some stuff going forward uh, that Kyle Larson and Denny Hamlin could still be mixing it up a little bit. I'm trying to take a look at my notes to see if I miss anything else here. Yeah, the Hendrick cars looked absolutely awful. They need to figure that out, especially if they want to be competitive at Phoenix later in the year. Considering they won both Phoenix and Richmond, earlier in the year to see them as bad as they are now. Gateway was like the first time we saw it. New Hampshire, they were bad. And now here, it's if I were them, I'd be mildly concerned, right? So not 100% sure what direction, well, the direction they need to go is forward, but um, what 100% changed or if just everybody else massively caught up to them. Because uh, what I think they got busted for, for cheating by NASCAR, wasn't necessarily anything that was going to make them that much better than everyone else. So yeah, Chris Buescher wins the race. Cool to see that. Cool to see RFK come back. More fast cars is better for the sport. So if RFK can be contending every week, that just increases the parity in the Cup Series and something that this sport desperately needs. Every racing series desperately needs it. Formula One way more than NASCAR. But um, getting a new winner in there, a uh, consistent winner is a good thing. So if Brad can get back to victory lane as well, I mean, that's a that's a net gain of, of two cars, right? You have Brad move out of that two car, goes over to the RFK, takes them up to now be contending cars, hopefully week in and week out. They still have some, you know, growing to do. But I think it's certainly something uh, that everybody should be happy about. If you're not happy about it, I don't know what's wrong with you. All right. The Cup Series, there just wasn't a lot to talk about, if we're being completely honest. So, moving on to the truck. We'll just do trucks at Richmond as well. Carson Hosovar picks up the win, burns it down. Higgy says he has the first best pit crew um, and the first best crew chief. And then he also said fucking on the broadcast. Literally caught his truck on fire during the burnouts because of those stupid mud flaps. And then he was trying to hype up the crowd. I don't know, Carson Hosovar did not seem 100% there after that race, and if he's moving to the Cup Series like is rumored to be happening next year, he needs to work on his endurance, because he said he's about to know Gragson and throw up after this race, and that's not ideal, because he's basically going to be running races that are twice as long as what he's running now. And, uh, yeah, so hopefully he's okay. Outside of that, it was a okay race. I In my notes, I wrote, meh, race, which it kind of was. But at the same time, it's Richmond. So, like, what do you, what do we expect from Richmond? Certainly nothing spectacular, apparently. Carson Hosovar wins the race. Ty Majeski should absolutely fire his crew chief, or Thor Sport should, because he leaves him out over the course of the entire final run on the same set of tires. Hosovar pits. He's obviously a lap behind, basically. And he runs him down and passes him with three laps to go in the race. And Ty Majeski has to finish, settle for second. Four laps to go in the race. So Majeski has to settle for second. Zane Smith comes home third after starting 15th. Uh, Jake Garcia fourth. Matt Mills making his first start of the year for Kyle Busch in that 51 truck. Comes home fifth. Corey Himes sixth. Matt Crafton seventh. Locks himself into the playoffs as well. Uh, Nick Sanchez eighth. Grant Enfinger ninth. And William Sawalich P10. It's kind of hard to win when everybody else has good equipment, William. Uh, Christian Eck is 11th, just kind of looking through here. Haley Deegan finished 15th. Um, she also punted the shit out of uh, Ryan Vargas, sent him spinning on what likely would have been a top 15 run there. Natalie Decker's boyfriend finished 33rd, running for Rayum Brothers. He was seven laps down, not ideal for him. And then, yeah, the point standings. We are now officially into the playoffs for the... Truck Series, and I don't trust Racing Reference at all, so I need to pull up the Truck Series playoffs on NASCAR's website. 
So, yes, we have... Oh, okay. Oh, they threw me off. So, truck series. We do Next race for the truck series will be IRP in two weeks. That will be the first race of their first round. Corey Heim, Zane Smith, Carson Hosovar, Christian Eckes are currently your top four. Grant Enfinger in fifth. Ty Majeski, sixth. Ben Rhodes, seventh. Nick Sanchez, eighth. Matt DiBenedetto, ninth. And Matt Crafton in P10. Having said, well, not having said all that, I haven't said that much yet. I will say, I think my final four for the championship will be Corey Heim, Zane Smith, Ty Majeski, and I'm going to say that Grant Enfinger makes it as well. I think that's my final four uh, over the uh, next, how many races do they have? Eight races left? seven races left. I need everybody, just for the sake of the sanity of all of us, can the Truck Series, Extended Series, and Cup Series all start their playoffs at the same race and then end at the same race? I don't care what happens in between there. Obviously, it would have to just be 10 straight weeks, but um, because my gosh, man, I'm trying to keep track of all of this. It's very difficult. So they have three, six, seven. Okay, that's what I thought. IRP coming up, Milwaukee Mile, Kansas, followed by Bristol, Taldega, and Homestead, and then the championship race at Phoenix on Friday night, which will likely be at 10 p.m. East Coast start time. This is going to lead into my next tirade for a minute. Fox absolutely does not care about NASCAR properties at all. I understand why it's at 10 o'clock on Friday, November 3rd. Well, that's because there's going to be college football likely on for a 7 o'clock kickoff at the same time. Um which is unfortunate because it will likely run over into that 10 o'clock hour. But Fox really does not care about the truck series or NASCAR in general. So this is a playoff cutoff race, right? It's pretty important. It's the truck series. We're heading into the playoffs. There's obviously a chance that somebody could get their way in, win their way in, something like that. So what do they do? They don't put practice and qualifying on television. Can't watch it. I think they were showing a replay of the Women's World Cup. And... Hang on, I'm going to say that the replay of the Women's World Cup likely would draw more viewers than Truck Series practice and qualifying. I'm not going to dispute that at all, because it probably does, definitely does. But at the same time, you could put it on either the streaming, the Fox Sports app, you could put it on there, or you could put it on FS2 as well. And then people are going to say, well, you know, they got to cut down on costs because then you have to pay people to be there. You're, they're using the same cameras that NBC's using, so realistically like not nothing different there and then you have to have your production i get it but at the same time this is supposed to be an important property for you all we hear is how fox loves to carry nascar they don't love it that much they just love the bit of a ratings bump that they get from it and the fact that they can sell ads for it because they probably got the truck series for pretty cheap if we're being completely honest certainly cheaper than the cw got the xfinity series so then come the race time on saturday night they don't send the booth to richmond which is not something that's out of the ordinary. It's something they've been doing since COVID happened. And it's unfortunate because Richmond, short tracks in general, are races that should have a booth there because you can see the entire track. You can see what's happening before the camera picks up on it, before a producer yells at you that somebody's spinning off a of turn four. It's so infuriating. And then they have them stand in the Charlotte studio with a wall of TVs behind them that's showing a, a static still shot of... Richmond to make it look like they're in the booth when they're clearly not and it absolutely fooled some mouth-breathing idiot on Twitter that was like What do you mean? They're not at the track. I saw them there and I was like, no, you didn't like you saw them standing in the studio But yeah, but it looked like they were there. I understand that I completely understand that it's because they put up a picture in the back that makes it look like Richmond and then the guy was like No, I know what the Richmond TV booth looks like and they were there Okay if that's what the Richmond TV booth looks like, that's also what the Bristol TV booth looks like, the Homestead TV booth, the Phoenix TV booth, Martinsville TV booth. They all look the same. NASCAR apparently has just put in a standard booth everywhere for the truck series. It's because they don't go to the fucking racetrack. And that's the really unfortunate part. It, the product is lacking because they're not there. And then you have a producer that has no idea what they're doing. Artie Kempner can pat his team on the back all they want. They're terrible. They're just not good anymore. And 
The, it, the good thing about Xfinity moving to the CW is it means less NASCAR on Fox. And if NASCAR and Fox just gave half of an ounce of care, they would be putting on a better product, better product. But they don't. And we get left with what we have, which is a half ass broadcast at best, best with Jamie Little trying to be a lead announcer. And she's just not. She's just not the anchor for a broadcast team. They need to stop with that experiment. Um, same with the ARCA series and her. She just doesn't have it. And maybe it's because we've... And this has nothing to do with men, male or female, but it's just the tone, the direction, and then her just at times cluelessness on the direction of the broadcast. And I know, I'll be the first to immediately jump on Rick Allen for being bad at his job, but he is pretty decent at keeping the conversation going or at least leading people into statements. She's just not. And uh, it's unfortunate that everybody else has to suffer because Fox wants to save some money and do what they do. So... All right, I'm getting off the soapbox there for for Fox. It's just unfortunate. Moving on to the Xfinity Series race at Road America, Sam Mayer and his 71st start for Junior Motorsports, JRM, finally picks up his first career win, something that he desperately needed to do because now he owns the record for the longest amount of races until he wins a race for JRM. Even Michael Annette beat him. He picks up the win after a late race caution that never should have even existed. So, let me go back here. On the restart for the first attempt at a green-white checker, uh, Connor Mozak is smoking all the way down the back stretch, through the final corners, to the choose cone and everything. Side note, that choose cone should have been set back two corners prior, or even on the back stretch. Having it set up right before the final corner gave those guys zero time a lot of times to catch up and try to stack the field up. It was just terrible planning. But Connor Mozak is obviously smoking. He's obviously dropping some sort of fluid because the smoke's coming out of the tailpipes. They let him restart. He immediately just drops water or oil all over the racetrack and then finally comes to a stop. They have to throw another caution. That caution never should have existed because Connor Mozak should have been black flagged and not allowed to restart. So then because of that, they had the red flag the race. And then Justin Allgaier, who dominated the day, ends up not winning the race because, well, in a sense, he used himself up. But at the same time, I'm so tired of seeing green-white checker races cost guys wins. Yeah, Justin Allgaier led 42 of 49 laps, doesn't get the win because NASCAR wouldn't black flag Connor Mozak and Connor Mozak wouldn't get off the freaking racetrack. So I just really hate when green-white checkers cost the best car of the day the race win, regardless of who's leading. Um, and it's back-to-back -back weeks now in the Xfinity Series where we've seen these late race cautions and green-white checkers cost drivers a chance at, or cost drivers the win that they would have had coming if there wasn't just this caution that came out. So that's really where my frustration comes with that. Parker Clearman comes home second, Austin Hill third, Sage Karen picks up his, I believe, first top five ever, Riley Herbst finishes fifth with four laps to go. Riley Herbst is in 16th place and Jeff Burton says, Keep an eye on Riley Herbst. He could win this race from 16th with four laps to go. Obviously, he didn't win the race, but he still got up to top five. Josh Berry, six. Kaz Grala, seventh. Uh, shout out to Kaz Grala's sponsor, Fire Department Coffee. Never heard of him before, but when a sponsor outfits the team with branded uniforms, you know that they're committed and you know that they're invested and they want to, you know, one, get their money's worth, but two, also show that they're like a tip top operation. And they bought the crew, obviously, they've outfitted the crew with fire suits that look like firefighter outfits, um, which is pretty cool. So shout out to them for being creative and putting the money in to do that. Josh Blicky, 8th. AJ Allmendinger, ninth after winning the poll. He had brake problems all day. And Brandon Jones in 10th. We had a really big wreck with Chandler Smith. His brakes blew. The rotors absolutely exploded down the front stretch. And then he just veered the car to the left to put it into the concrete barriers, the jersey barriers there, to slow some speed down. Ends up peeling off the entire left side of the car like a can opener. Luckily, he was okay. But one of the stranger incidents that we've ever seen there. And then we also had Alex LeBay get into the tire barriers very hard. John Hunter Nemechek decided to go behind like he was driving a stadium super truck. Ramped coming out of the penultimate corner. Lands into the grass, rips the splitter off the car, destroyed the front end of that race car. He was just leaking oil and antifreeze everywhere in his pit box. 
Um, but he also hit like nine people before he finally took himself out. So about time that he did that. Overall, though, like the la it was an exciting last couple of laps. Like I'll give him that. Was it manufactured because of that caution? Absolutely. So Connor Mo NASCAR should thank Connor Mozak for that. But I saw a ton of people being like, this is why Road America needs a cup date. No, it doesn't because a two-lap shootout at Road America that was manufactured by NASCAR's ineptitude of, for not being able to black flag a car doesn't give the Cup Series any credence because the two Cup Series races there were not very good. Road America shows out, absolutely. All the fans come out, that's a great scene. But in terms of the racing, it's okay, but it's not the best road course racing we've ever seen. It's also a very long lap. I love Road America. Man, is that a long lap. Uh, so yeah, that's kind of where I stand at there. The Formula One race from Belgium, it took Max for stopping 14 laps to get to the lead after starting P6, and then he proceeded to lead the next 30, dominate the race, win by 28 seconds or whatever it was, and continues his streak. Eight consecutive wins now, 13 in a row now for Red Bull. I honestly don't see anybody else winning this year, barring Max having some sort of mechanical failure, but the fact that they haven't had one yet makes me think that they might not have one now, which is super depressing. Lewis Hamilton pitted late in the race and nipped away the fastest lap from, from Max, finishes P4. Uh, yeah, I mean, that's good, right? It takes a point away from Max, but it's a bit like stealing that point away is basically, <laughs> it's just bad, right? It's um, probably how Danny can feel it feels. Anytime something good happens to him, he's like, that was nice. And then he quickly remembers that Max Verstappen stole his seat at Red Bull. And then Max Verstappen won two driver's championships and stole his girlfriend. And now is like the parent to his child. It, not a great feeling. Like it's cool, but it's also like, oh damn, I forgot that we're still getting our asses kicked every single race. So yeah, that's, uh, that was the Formula One Grand Prix. Carlos Sainz uh, ruined Oscar Piastri's race at the start. And then blamed it all on Oscar Piastri because nothing's ever been Carlos Sainz's fault. Never has, never will be, uh, which is confusing at best. Yuki Tsunoda got a top 10, which is good for him. Esteban Ocon climbed seven, eight spots, no, six spots to finish, Jesus, six spots to finish P8. Uh, good result for him. Ferrari lucked into a podium with Charles. Uh, and I say that because I'm sure they have no idea how they actually finished third uh, there as well. They're off until the end of September. No, then the end of August. Jeez. And they'll be back for the Dutch Grand Prix where Max Verstappen will win again. Moving on to the last bit of news that we have. Shane Van Gisbergen did say at the end, or this past Sunday, that in his press conference that he will be headed to America in 2024. He said that he did not say it was full-time. He said it, it was not for sure going to be full-time. He also talked to print media about possibly taking the Marcus Ambrose approach and doing a year of Xfinity to learn ovals, which I think would serve him well. Obviously, Dale Jr. has one, if not two, spots open in Xfinity. Would love to see him land over there, and GM should do everything in their power to make that happen, if that's what the path he wants to take is. But SVG's coming. He said he's focused right now on helping his Triple Eight engineering team land the best replacement possible. And if not, well, I mean, regardless if they do or not, he's likely coming to NASCAR next year, which is pretty sick. He'll be in action two weeks from now at the Indianapolis Road Course in the Trackhouse 91 car. Brody Kostecki, the um, Supercars points leader now, I believe, will also be there driving a third car for Richard Childress Racing, the number 33 car, which Australian Supercars as a series is actually being a, uh, a associate sponsor on. So... Pretty exciting things happening on that front. This weekend, we have the NASCAR Cup and Xfinity Series at Michigan, and the IndyCar Series is in Nashville for the Nashville Grand Prix, Music City Grand Prix, whatever the heck they call it now. Uh, last year on its current layout, it'll be moving to a different layout next year and also be the season finale next year as well. There'll be an announcement, an official announcement about that coming up on Thursday, August 3rd. So keep your eyes peeled for that. Also, Tuesday, August 1st, is the day that a lot of IndyCar drivers are able to sign with other teams for 2024. So we'll see if some announcements happen on 
Tuesday or throughout the week or this weekend, but IndyCar free agency is about to um, open up. So, having said all that, like and subscribe to the YouTube channel. Um, follow me on TikTok at Break Hard. Instagram, Twitter, and Threads, even though I never post on Threads anymore, is at Break Hard Blog. Talk to you guys next week.